I've made several videos about various haunted places all over New Orleans, but today I wanted to switch gears a bit and talk about another one of the South's most famous haunted cities, Savannah, Georgia. Savannah is a beautiful city with a rich history that stretches all the way back to 1733. It's been named one of the top 10 most beautiful places in America by USA Weekend Magazine and is the childhood home of Flannery O'Connor. But Savannah also has a darker history as one of the most haunted cities in the country. Savannah has certainly had its fair share of death and destruction. 10 separate yellow fever incidents killed tens of thousands of people, and numerous fires and murders only contributed to the city's dark past. So it's no wonder so many buildings in Savannah have a paranormal story behind them. Let's look at just 10 of the creepiest haunted places in Savannah, Georgia. Number one, the Foley House Inn. Built by a wealthy widow named Honoria Foley back in 1896, the Foley House Inn boasts 19 beautiful guest rooms and has been named Best Inn in the South by Southern Living Magazine. But underneath that beauty is a pretty crazy story. The inn was built over a house that had been destroyed by the Great Savannah Fire in 1889. But despite these dark beginnings, the first hundred or so years of the inn's operation went relatively smoothly. Mrs. Foley and later her son and grandchildren all lived at the inn, with nothing too bizarre happening. But all this turned on its head in 1987, when human remains were found in a wall of the building. To this day, the remains have never been identified, though many people believe the body belonged to a guest at the inn. There is a theory behind who this person is and what happened to them, but I'd say it's really more of a legend. As the story goes, the body belonged to a man in town who was romantically interested in Mrs. Foley and booked a room at the inn to get close and woo her. But when he got her alone and made his move, Mrs. Foley wasn't having it. He attacked her and she hit him over the head with a candlestick, killing him. Although this killing was clearly done in self-defense, Mrs. Foley was afraid she'd be implicated in the murder. So she convinced another boarder to help her hide the body, where it remained hidden for decades. At some point, the dead person was given the nickname Wally, because he was found in a wall, so Wally. Look, I didn't name the guy. Anyway, I'm not sure if the ghost story started before or after Wally's body was found, but people have reported seeing a man in a top hat in the inn's garden late at night. In another account, one guest said she saw a man enter the front of the building and disappear into the wall. She didn't find out until the next day that he had disappeared into the exact place in the wall that Wally's body was found years earlier. The story of who Wally really is is probably just that, a story. But regardless of its authenticity or lack thereof, the Foley House Inn doesn't shy away from its paranormal past. It offers a haunted Savannah package that includes a haunted pub tour, placement in a supposedly haunted room, and lunch at another one of Savannah's famous haunted locations, Moon River Brewing. Number two, Factors Walk. On a bluff close to the Savannah River sits an area known as Factors Walk. The buildings that line it used to be cotton warehouses, though they've since been converted into various shops and office buildings, and connected by iron and concrete walkways. But one of the most interesting aspects of this area is the tunnels. These tunnels supposedly go all over Savannah, and one of the entrances is at Factors Walk. They're thought to have been used to transport slaves who are led through the buildings and into the tunnels. On an even darker note, there are stories of people being bricked up in the walls. Between the Poe-esque stories and slave tunnels, it's easy to see why people experience paranormal activity in this area. The ghosts of slaves, disembodied moans, and shadow people have all been reported. These particular ghosts are also pretty touchy-feely as quite a bit of physical contact has been reported, including people who felt cold hands touching them. A now closed store called Melanie's also had a woman in blue. Witnesses would hear disembodied footsteps and see a woman clad in blue who would promptly vanish. Small objects would also break seemingly on their own, though to be fair, that could have just been the work of a careless employee. Number three, the Savannah Theater. Opened in 1818, the Savannah Theater was one of the many locations damaged by the fires that ravaged the city. 
As a result, it's been rebuilt multiple times and paranormal activity has been reported there as far back as 1895. All the ghosts who haunt the theater are thought to have died there, and there are quite a few of them. Among them are a ghost actress who appears on stage and a ghost director whose disembodied voice shouts from an empty seat in the audience. Both a little boy and little girl have been spotted as well as heard from the balcony. The little boy is said to be named Ben and he loves harassing the spotlight operator. There's also a projectionist ghost who has been seen on the balcony and in the projection room. I assume left over from when the theater used to be an actual movie theater. According to one popular story concerning the theater, a group of female dancers was getting ready for a show. They were all in the middle of changing costumes when they felt like something was watching them. Presumably all at once, which is interesting itself. So they freaked and ran out of the dressing room, even though they weren't done changing. I'm sure that was quite a sight for theater goers and staff. There's one more thing about the Savannah Theater that I find interesting. Several well-known actors have performed there, including Oscar Wilde and Lillian Russell. Also among these names is Edwin Booth, the brother of John Wilkes Booth, who of course assassinated President Abraham Lincoln back in 1865. I wonder if this dark connection makes the theater more susceptible to hauntings. Number four, Colonial Park Cemetery. These days, if you have a problem with someone and want to confront them, you're probably just going to end up yelling at them on Facebook or something. It's pretty unlikely that you'd meet them at a dueling ground and pull a weapon on them, at least not without someone calling 911. But for a pretty large portion of American history, dueling was perfectly legal. One of these dueling grounds was just outside Colonial Park Cemetery in Savannah. Established in 1750, the Six Acre Cemetery holds over 9,000 graves and was the city's main public cemetery before it was closed to burials in 1853. But the ghosts of people who died in duels probably aren't the only spirits here. Remember those yellow fever epidemics I talked about earlier? As it turns out, quite a few yellow fever victims are buried in Colonial Park. How many exactly? That's a good question. A plaque at the cemetery says that nearly 700 Savannah residents succumbed to yellow fever that year. But how many is nearly 700? Some people believe there are actually 666 victims and whoever wrote the plaque rounded up to avoid references to the so-called devil's number. After the cemetery was closed to burials, Union soldiers occupied Savannah during the Civil War. These soldiers reportedly vandalized the graves, changing death dates and even digging up plots and moving the bodies. Many people believe that the boundaries of the cemetery have shifted and that people are now buried on the street outside the cemetery rather than in the actual grounds. If this did happen, it's not necessarily the fault of Union soldiers. The graves were probably just moved to make room for new ones. But if I were a ghost and someone vandalized and or moved my grave, I'd be pretty upset, just putting it out there. Number six, the Old Candler Hospital. Georgia's first hospital was originally named Savannah Poorhouse and Hospital and chartered in 1804 for sick seamen. Go ahead and make your jokes, I don't even care. The building was eventually acquired by the Georgia Hospital Board of the Methodist Episcopal Church South and renamed in honor of Bishop Warren Candler. It moved locations in 1980 and merged with St. Joseph's Hospital, where it remains today. As of 2016, the old building is for sale, but sits abandoned. Just like Factors Walk, this old hospital building has tunnel entrances. The rumor is that the tunnels were used to store the bodies of the many yellow fever victims that died at the hospital, and that said bodies were used for illegal autopsies. One witness claims they went to the tunnels with a group, and as soon as the group started to discuss these illegal autopsies, all of their flashlights shut off. But believe it or not, the other building's notable attraction might be even darker. On the property sits an old oak tree known as the Hanging Tree. Witnesses have reported seeing apparitions hanging from the tree at night. Of course, if you're anything like me, you might hear the phrase hanging tree and immediately think of Mockingjay. Admit it, you just started singing the song. It's okay, I did too. Number six, the Sorrel Weed House. Arguably one of the more well-known places on this list, the Sorrel Weed House has been featured on shows like Ghost Hunters, Ghost Adventures, and BuzzFeed Unsolved. 
Considering that it's been called one of the most haunted houses in the country, that's probably not a shock. But before there was a house, the land was the setting for the Siege of Savannah in 1779. It was the middle of the Revolutionary War, and the British had just taken Savannah the previous December. So the American troops recruited the French to help retake it. The siege lasted from September 16th to October 18th, but the French and Americans failed to retake the city. The British remained in control of it until the end of the war. The siege ended with nearly 300 soldiers dead and over 600 wounded. So the land already had some pretty bad vibes going for it from the start. In the early 1840s, Francis Sorrell built the house for he and his wife, Lucinda. Lucinda died a few years later and Francis remarried to her younger sister, Matilda. But when Matilda found her husband in bed with a slave girl named Molly, she jumped to her death from the balcony. Molly also died a few weeks later, presumably by her own hand or perhaps at the hands of Matilda's vengeful spirit. Needless to say, there's no short of reports of strange activity at the house. Guests have claimed to take orb photos and audio recordings of screams. One author captured a person on camera who they didn't believe was part of their tour group and thinks he may have been the ghost of a soldier. A lady in black has also been spotted on the premises, though it's not entirely clear just who she is. The house offers all sorts of tours, both paranormal and historical. Guests can participate in their own paranormal investigation investigations three times a week, as well as an after-hours paranormal lockdown, which sounds just like a paranormal investigation that lasts all night. Personally, I think I'm getting a bit too old to stay up all night. But if you are unwilling or unable to make it to the house yourself, there are tons of investigations that have been filmed and posted all over the internet. So give them a watch for yourself and see if you believe the legends. Number seven, right square. Named for James Wright, Georgia's last loyal governor, Wright Square was laid out in 1733, making it one of the city's oldest squares. In that time, it's amassed quite a few terrible stories, which in turn have led to ghostly legends. The first one doesn't seem to have any sort of real life story attached to it, so I thought I'd go ahead and tell it first, and that is the story of the racist ghost. Witnesses have reported the ghost of a white woman who carries around a stick and swings it at any black person she comes across. You know, I've heard a lot of strange things since starting this channel, but I think racist ghost is a new one. Technically, there's only one person buried in the square. Tomachichi was chief of the Yamacraw tribe and an English ally. He had always wanted to be buried close to his English friends in Savannah, and when he died in 1737, that request was granted. His body was buried in the center of the square and marked by rocks. But 1882 brought the death of another prominent Savannah figure, Georgia Railroad founder William Washington Gordon. He's not actually buried in the square, but the rocks marking Tomachichi's grave were strewn about to make room for a memorial to Gordon. Some sources say Tomachichi's body was exhumed and his bones scattered about, but I'm not sure if this is actually true. A full monument to Tomachichi was eventually erected and now sits in the southeast corner of the square. As the legend goes, if you run around his grave three times while saying Tomochichi, his ghost may appear. But the square's most famous ghost is that of a woman named Alice Riley. Alice and a man named Richard White were Irish immigrants who came to Savannah in the early 1730s. Some sources say they were husband and wife, but most say they were lovers. Regardless, Alice and Richard became indentured servants to a man named William Wise. William was a cruel master, and Alice and Richard devised a plan to escape. It was Alice's job to bathe William, so one day while she was bathing him, she strangled him with a neckerchief and dunked his head under water until he died. The couple tried to run away, but was caught pretty quickly and almost immediately taken to the gallows. Richard was hanged almost right away, but Alice's life was spared for a few more months because she was pregnant. It's assumed the baby was Richard's, but some people believe the father was actually William Wise, which would make him even more cruel than we'd ever imagined. Alice gave birth to a baby boy named James sometime in late 1734. In January 1735, six weeks after giving birth, she was hanged. James died just two weeks after his mother and they were buried together in a grave just outside Wright Square. 
But did the police have the wrong culprit all along? Alice always maintained her innocence, and there is speculation that she and Richard were framed because they were Irish Catholics who weren't looked on too well back then. There were also rumors that Alice was a witch who cursed the town before she died, but those were also rumors largely thought to be brought on by the anti-Irish, anti-Catholic sentiment of the day. Well, there is still quite a bit of anti-Catholic sentiment even today, but that's a different video. And whether Alice's spirit is angry because she was killed for a crime she didn't commit, or whether she's just sorry she got caught, she has a pretty good motive to stick around and mess with the living. Alice is said to roam the square, approaching pregnant women or women with babies and trying to take their babies away. Others say she cries out for her own son, but promptly disappears when anyone tries to help. Her story reminds me a lot of La Llorona, though she's clearly a much more sympathetic ghost. Number 8. The 1790 Inn Contrary to what it may seem like, the 1790 Restaurant and Inn wasn't founded in 1790. It actually used to be three separate buildings, all of which were built in the 1800s. 1790 is a reference to the year Savannah had their first mayoral election and formed a city government. The first two ghosts that supposedly call this place home don't really have backstories. The first is a boy named Thaddeus who's been spotted on the first floor, specifically in the restaurant. He likes to leave pennies lying around, and guests feel a warm presence supposedly caused by him. I've never heard of a ghost that hands out money, but he's more than welcome to come to my house and leave coins lying around. The next ghost isn't quite as nice. This one was supposedly a voodoo priestess and likes to hang out in the kitchen, throwing pots and pans and spice jars at workers. She's said to target women quite a bit, though she herself is a woman. Ghosts are weird. But the inn's most famous ghost has so many stories attached to her, most sources can't even agree on her name. She was either named Anna or Anne. She was either in an arranged marriage with a sailor or was in an arranged marriage to someone else and fell in love with a sailor. She may or may not have been a barmaid at the hotel. In most versions, her story ends the same. Her sailor boyfriend leaves her, and in her distress, she jumps to her death from a third floor window of the hotel. In some versions, she's killed by her husband. The husband she cheated on with the sailor, not the sailor she was in an arranged marriage with. I know, it's confusing. Anna has said to haunt room 204, the room where she supposedly fell to her death. Guests have reported small items like jewelry and wallets being moved and tugging on their sheets. Some even say they've seen a strange girl in the room standing by the bed and crying. I've also read that Miley Cyrus stayed here while filming the last song in 2009 and tweeted out a picture of a handprint on her boots, supposedly from Anna. I could never find the original tweet, but the last song was filmed on nearby Tybee Island, so a story like this is certainly possible. Number 9. Calhoun Square the supposed most haunted square in Old Savannah isn't just the home of churches, schools, and private residences. It's also a burial ground for slaves. Bones exhumed from the square in the early 2000s were later found to be the 200-year-old bones of slaves. It's thought that at least 1,000 slaves are buried underneath Calhoun Square, though nobody can really say for sure. Countless people have reported feeling a heavy weight on their chest or had shadows passing through them while walking through Calhoun Square. But most of the legends surrounding the square are centered on one house, 432 Abercorn Street. There are multiple stories about what might have happened here, and there's not really any evidence to back any of them up, but they're still told today and it probably won't be too hard for you to figure out why. The first story concerns a former owner named Benjamin Wilson. Benjamin reportedly wasn't too happy about his daughters playing with kids at the nearby Massey School, where most of the students were lower class. So as punishment, he tied her to a chair and left her there for several days until she died. Another story tells of a family who left their four daughters at home and three of them were dead when they came back. The story never specifies exactly how the daughters died. But in my opinion, the most interesting story associated with 432 Abercorn concerns another former resident named Wesley Espy. Wesley's father was Carl Espy, a judge who was secretly involved with bootleggers. Wesley fell in love with a girl who was dating a bootlegger who had ties to Carl Espy. 
I'm starting to realize how much this whole thing sounds like a bad soap opera. Carl found out about the relationship between Wesley and the bootlegger's girlfriend and begged him to stop seeing her, not wanting his son to have to bear the wrath of the bootleggers. But Wesley didn't listen. Soon after this conversation, Wesley was found dead outside the home. People thought he jumped from the balcony or perhaps fell in some sort of freak accident. Others are skeptical of this and believe it was murder, either at the hands of Carl or one of the bootleggers. To add evidence to this theory, Wesley had a very specific injury to his lower body that couldn't have been caused by a simple fall. I won't go into any more detail because I would like to not get demonetized, though the way this video is going, that might happen anyway. Wesley has been seen on the porch in the early mornings, supposedly coming back home after a late night out with his girlfriend. Or maybe he just wanted to watch the sunrise. People have also reported shadowy figures, strange noises, cameras failing in the area, crying and giggling. The current owners don't actually live in the house, but in the carriage house behind it, so make of that what you will. Number 10, the Grebel House. The building at 401 West Perry Street is now a warehouse, but until 1941, it was a boarding house and the site of what the press would later call the most diabolical crime in the history of Savannah. On December 8, 1909, Maggie Hunter moved into the boarding house, then owned by Eliza Gribble and her daughter, Carrie Olander. Maggie was newly separated from her husband, J.C. Hunter, and no doubt looking for a fresh start but it didn't last long. The very next afternoon, a passerby found Maggie in the doorway of the house. She was barely alive, her skull having been crushed by an ax. Eliza Gribble and Carrie Olander were found inside. They had suffered the same fate, but had already succumbed to their wounds. Maggie died three days later, but right before she died, she implicated her estranged husband in the crime. But the police and the press took the case in a different direction. Warring newspapers of the day insisted the culprit was black, and police questioned over 150 black men. There was fear that the murders and subsequent suspicions of black men would prompt race riots, and at least one was reported. But finally, on February 10th, J.C. Hunter and two other men were indicted in the murders. J.C. was convicted and sentenced to death, but later pardoned by then-Governor Clifford Walker in 1923. It's largely believed that he killed his wife due to anger over her infidelity, and the other two women were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Even though the Gribble House is now a warehouse, it has no shortage of hauntings. The grounds apparently also used to be slave quarters, so that no doubt contributes. Local paranormal investigators have captured EVPs in the area and one of them was even physically scratched. People have reported being touched and hearing voices that told them to get out. A lady in white appears in a wedding dress, as well as a shadow man. Well, I don't think the shadow man wears a wedding dress, but you know what I mean. At one point, people could tour the warehouse and even conduct their own paranormal investigations. I don't think you can do that anymore, but I'm pretty sure you can at least see the building and hear the story through the Ghosts and Gravestones trolley tour. Come to think of it, you can probably see a lot of these locations on that tour, as well as one of the many others that Savannah has to offer. So those are just 10 of Savannah's haunted locations. There are tons that I had to leave out, but I might delve into some of them deeper in a later video. So have you ever visited Savannah or experienced any paranormal activity there? Let me know in the comments. I was in Atlanta last year and thought about stopping by Savannah, but ultimately it was just too far out of the way to justify a detour. Now that I've learned some more about the hauntings there, I'm kind of starting to regret it. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and share it. And for more dark content from me, I hope that you will consider subscribing and hitting that bell. Don't forget, The Revenants is now available in ebook and paperback, and there's a link in the description where you can order it and any of my other books. Thanks for watching and have a creepy day. Bye guys. Hey guys, I was just putting the finishing touches on this video and I just wanted to pop in really quick and say 
Thank you to everyone who has bought The Revenant so far. Um, ever since my channel started growing, my book sales have also gone up. So thank you to everyone who has bought any of my books. A couple of people have asked if I'm going to start selling autographed copies. Um, that's something that I have considered. So if I can find an efficient way to do it at some point, then I would love to be able to do that at some point in the future. Thanks and have a great day.